series. And I'm sure it's very nice to see still people who are around and <laughs> quite a large number than we had initially anticipated. And I have a request after uh, 8 o'clock when the talk gets over, please stay back all of you for a couple of minutes more. Okay? Just for two minutes. Then this session is over. So I think uh, uh, the last one is introduction of telescopic astronomy and some important remarks. Now I will not discuss telescope here because that is not the objective and I hope that most of you are aware of the basic principles behind optical telescope, both reflecting type and refracting type. Now how it was developed by Galileo under what circumstances, that is a wonderful story. And I give a lecture on that and a drama has been written which will be staged in Calcutta and Bhopal. Uh, that story of Galileo is generally not known. It is only the fight with the church, etc., inquisition. That is the main theme of drama popularly. But this one I prepared during the summer and now rehearsals are going on. Maybe sometimes I will request IIT Kanpur Jimkhana to stage it, you know. You identify a person for Galileo's role. <laughs> So what I'll do today is that uh, that introduction of telescopic astronomy in India, briefly, and uh, some interesting stories behind it. And another thing I'll tell you that it came primarily for observing the transit of Venus. You might have heard about it recently in 2012. We had the transit of Venus, isn't it? Did, was there any uh, observation in the campus? You have an astronomy club. Because these, uh, these transits are very important because that helps you to determine the distance of the Earth, Sun, etc. very accurately. So it has always been uh, an important task and it is not a very frequent event. Now I think the next one will be about some hundred years back later. So, in one lifetime, one can see at the most two such transits. So, I think uh, in India, the first telescope, you know, came uh, along with the uh, Jesuit priests. And as if you remember, in the very first lecture I mentioned that in Thailand, uh, French government, King of France sent a team at the request of the King of Thailand and they came with a 12-inch uh, telescope and uh, some astronomers in the 16th century or 17th century. Then there was a, a coup and they had to leave and they fled to India and settled in Pondicherry with their telescope. But even before that, the first Jesuit priests came and they colonized Goa in the 16th century, beginning of the 16th century. And then I think in 1541, St. Francis Xavier came to Goa and the mission was established, if you, re if you have read that. Even Akbar came to know about the scholarship of this Jesuit priest and he invited some missionaries to his court. And Father Antony, I don't know how to pronounce it in French, it must be something different as it looks like. The French pronunciation is very different from what you write, I don't know why. Had it been German, I would have read it. You know. And uh, he was in the group that visited Akbar's court and could make a very good impression on the emperor with his knowledge of science and astronomy. When Akbar took him along with to Kabul in 1580, he actually determined the positions of about 100 places while traveling from Agra to Kabul. And he also compiled a partial map of India that was based upon his astronomical observations. <coughs> now, Jai Singh, we have discussed in the last lecture, the, it was, of course, he was a medieval astronomer and dealt with only this Siddhantik or Jeej astronomy, considering a geocentric model. And most historians of science consider Jai Singh to be a, a historical anachronism and his contributions as scientifically irrelevant. It is not commonly known that he made use of his telescope which he had and carried out some observations. It must be remembered, as mentioned earlier, it took quite some time for astronomical telescope to become instruments for observation when the crossware uh, technology was uh, found out. It is not a technology, but the uh, device kind of thing. So it took quite some time for astronomical telescope to become instruments. And 
earlier it was only for viewing kind of thing, qualitative results you could get. And the results which we could get from the heliocentric model and those early telescopes were no way better actually. You could see that even uh, one minute of arc you could um, do, two minutes of arc with the help of uh, naked eye instruments. So there was no motivation on the part of Jai Singh to pay too much effort and attention to telescopic observation or the heliocentric. According to scholars like S.M. Ansari, Jai Singh actually did something and references are found on the following topics in his writings. That means the ellipticity of the lunar and solar orbits, he worked on that, the existence of four Jovian satellites, obloid shape of planet Saturn as I mentioned in the last class and phases of planet Venus and Mercury. Now a detailed study of several available manuscripts of G. G. Muhammad Shah which was compiled by Jai Singh have been analyzed in depth by Ansari before coming to the above conclusion. Now as Jai Singh continued with the idea of a geocentric universe, researchers failed to notice many interesting diagrams and noting in the margin of the manuscript which indicate telescopic observation. Not in the main text but in the margins there are lots of notings. Another thing I mentioned that why Jai Singh uh, really could not go into the heliocentric model because he depended too much on uh, the Jesuit priests and he sent them to Portugal and the Jesuit priests, they themselves were very much against the heliocentric model and they did everything possible to isolate Jai Singh from the new developments in Italy and Europe. Anyhow, but the main impetus for astronomy, astronomical activities by Europeans in the early period was predominantly of scientific inquisitiveness and another thing that is India being a tropical country with frequent occurrence of clear sky and warm weather provided better conditions for astronomical observations for the people from France and England. The other source of importance of astronomy in India was from a practical requirement for the newly established colony to survey and map India. Though the Europeans reached India through sea routes, even before the Mughals came actually, they remained confined to the coastal areas only. So their knowledge about the interior of the subcontinent, it was negligible. The peninsula of India was not known to them. And in those periods, the subject astronomy had two wings, pure astronomy and applied astronomy. Pure astronomy represented the field involving the basics of astronomical science, whereas applied astronomy was primarily for surveying purpose. You know, uh, astronomy was the, the very important tool for surveying the land. And the initial major application of ast astronomy in India, telescopic astronomy in India was for surveying purpose. One was for determination of the latitude, other was determination of longitude and determination of longitude was with the help of transit telescopes. There are very special telescopes you will find I have given in the book and these telescopes had very limited maneuverability but gave much accurate results. They were used for the longitude determination. Latitude determination was somewhat easier and uh, Father Jeffrey Bouch started observation related to the survey of the country in the year 1689 at Pondicherry. You know the great triangular survey of India is very famous. I think I don't know whether our library had that book. Many things happened finding the height of the peaks like Everest etc. All it was a very great activity in the history of civil engineering and surveying. Great trigonometrical survey of India. And it started from south. The first one uh, what we say the back, backbone was created and then it sprayed on both sides by triangulation. <coughs> now uh, his map of the interior was the first dependable map in the year 1722. That's one curious question. Hmm. From that uh, positional astronomy, from the different timings like Banaras or, or hmm. Jain, hmm. from the difference in hmm. sun shadow, hmm. when we get the uh, longitude as well, Longitude by the Oh, then sun. you actually, you know, for longitude you need a clock. 
Earlier, the problem of longitude, there is a book, book type name itself is longitude. You know, when Galileo gave the first hint that you can use the four moons of Jupiter, which are visible from any place, and their occultation can be used, uh, which is a periodic event, which could be used as a clock. And it was being done. And when it was being done, Roemer was one of the person who was trying to do that, and he had a byproduct, the speed of light. Because you have all read in history of science that he found first the history of light, eh, velocity of light, and that was on that occasion he was trying to use the moons of Jupiter as a clock. So he got the speed of light. And uh, 1687. As I meant, this is that story I will not repeat. And those people, they brought their 12 foot telescope, 12 foot, so not 12 inch, 12 foot telescope, and they started pure astronomical observation from Pondicherry. The uh, main contributions were observing the comet of December 1689, discovery of the binary nature of Alpha Centuries, then correct latitude and longitude of Pondicherry, the Megalin clouds, and correct prediction of the lunar eclipse of April 14, 1689. Apart from making astronomical observations, the father started teaching astronomy at a Jesuit school in Mailapur till the end of his life in 1693. More organized activities started subsequently for both pure astronomy and for the major surveying work by East India Company and major source of inspiration for astronomical observation was impending transit of Venus in 1761 and 1769. This transit of Venus occurs at interval of eight years, then it will take another hundred years, you have to wait for the next one. That was the main thing and at that time, during this period, England and France, they were at war, a seven year war was going on when this was to happen. So, both governments sent the teams to India and there is a very nice story and about this. So, this story I will tell, then I will explain um, uh, the, about the, how the, it is used. This story is very interesting story in the history of science and it is also a tragic thing. Uh, I will read, it is a story, it is just like a story you see uh, how sometimes the fate can be so cruel to scientists. It should be remembered that when the first of these transits took place in 1761, Europe's seven year war was raging from 1756 to 1763. Both the British and French scientists were planning the observation at different places from where the transit was expected to be visible. The British team which headed to Sumatra had to make their observation at Cape of Good Hope because of bad weather, the ship had a lot of difficulties and so they were forced to do it from Cape of Good Hope and the results were not at all acceptable because it was a moving ship. The French team went to Siberia on an island in the Indian and an island in the... Uh, because you need to have the observation from two different latitudes, almost along a same meridian approximately. I will explain the whole thing then you will realize why. It is essential to observe and take the data from two different latitudes of the transit phenomena. The astronomer in charge of the team to India was La Gentile, you know, whom I mentioned until first. And La Gentile, after arriving near the Malabar coast, came to know that the French colony at Pondicherry, that was his destination, was taken over by the British. So he had to turn back towards Mauritius and which was under French control and observed the transit on 6th June from a moving ship with great difficulty. So La Gentil decided to observe the next transit on 4th June 1769. So this was 1761. So the next one was after 8 years. So he decided not to go back to Europe to wait and uh, observe the next one. So, he stayed and waited at Mauritius for the next seven years and arrived at Pondicherry on 27 March 1768 to observe that 4th June uh, transit almost a year in advance. 
and a suitable observatory was erected at Pondicherry with the help of the local French government. And interestingly, the British at Madras also helped La Gentile by providing him a very good telescope for the observation. By that time, the war was over in Europe. So during the year, La Gentile spent <coughs> at Pondicherry, he came across some Siddhantic astronomers, as I mentioned, that Nana Mudu and other that story who could do the calculation using a table. But the anti-climax of, of the story is that La Gentile's long wait and 11 year long voyage to India was that on the day of the event in June 1769, the sky was over Pondicherry covered with clouds and the mission to observe two transits of Venus remained unaccomplished. So 11 years effort, <laughs> nothing happened. It is a really painful thing. Now I think uh, the observation, now I will say, uh, this was an interesting story, in how scientists devote their life. Ultimately, sometimes they may not be rewarded with good results. Now the planet Venus and Mercury is orbiter within that of the Earth, and obviously, therefore, you will see at times they are crossing through the disk of the Sun, and that is called the transit. And they are found to move across the Sun's disk because they are very small. Besides being fascinating phenomena in solar astronomy, these transits were of great importance to early telescopic astronomy for accurate determination of the Earth's sun distance. As the angular diameter of Venus during a transit is about one minute of arc compared to 31.5 minutes of arc of the sun's disk, it appears as a small dark dot against the disk of the sun. A lot of people in Calcutta, they arranged the observation of the transit of Venus. I wonder why it was not done here. Many group, student groups and researchers, they did it. They went to uh, different places and did it. But of course, I must tell you, that observing it from just one place may not give you that good result. So generally, sometimes they do it from two places with two different latitudes. Now, there are about 12 transits of Venus in every millennium. That means in 1,000 years, you will get only 12 uh, opportunities to observe Venus transit. That's why they are so important. And the transits take place in pairs, eight years apart, followed by another pair after 121 and a half years. So 2012, we had one. So the next one will be 2000, how much, 2133, yeah. So in the last, your grand grandsons can observe that, of course. In the last four centuries, the transit of Venus occurred as per the table given below. You can see 16, which were observed actually. 1631, 1639 in December, 1761, 1769 in June. That's why it is difficult because in June, in India, generally you will have cloud cover, whereas December is a good one time. Pondicherry is less cloud cover. Never hmm? rains there. But in winter it rains, hmm. they return monsoon. Then uh, 1874, 1882, and the last one was 2004 and 2012. So now, I think uh, we have lost the opportunity. None of us will be able to see the next one. <laughs> you see, transit of Venus is like this. So this is the sun, this is the orbit of Venus, and this is the orbit of the Earth. So from Earth, from two places, you observe the transit. So what it happens? Venus describes an arc or a line in this disk of the sun as seen from the arc. But the two lines are different because one draws a line here and this draws a line there. And uh, these two lines, their gap is nothing but the parallax of Venus at sun. Isn't it? So the one which I think was observed from Pretoria and London simultaneously, the two lines which were seen, path of Venus during the transit. This is seen from Pretoria, that is South Africa, and this is observed from London. These are the two lines which were described and found. So you see, if D be the distance to the sun from the Earth, and R be the Earth's radius, then the solar parallax P 
when observed from equator and from the pole, that means the distance is r. So, parallax will be r by d, simple. And p is nothing but angle in radians. Or the distance you can find out, if you can find out the parallax, then distance you can find out as r by p. Now, if delta be the angular distance between the two paths just now I shown you, traced by Venus as observed from two different locations on the earth at a distance of s apart in a direction perpendicular <coughs> to Venus's path of course, then the parallax which you will get in this case is nothing but delta and d by d minus 1, the simple uh, geometry. And where d is the distance of Venus from the sun and using Kepler's third law, we know that the radius of the earth orbit and radius of the Venus orbit, their ratios q <coughs> is square of the peri periods ratio. You all know that that is Kepler's third law. So what they do, they apply that then. So now you get another relation, capital D by small d, distance of the earth from sun by distance of Venus from sun, that q is the period is known accurately. So, in all such measurements, distance is the most difficult thing to measure. Period you can measure, angle you can measure, I mean to say angular distance. So, you can find out the two ratios, the distance of the earth and distance of the Venus from sun, that is 1.38248. So, when small p is 0.38248 delta, and capital D is S by 0.38, that this ratio, if D by D is this much, minus 1 means what? It will be 0.38248 and into delta. So, this is nothing but this, you subtract 1. And capital D will be then also the S divided by this, that is the parallax. So, this is the typically uh, the procedure, very simple procedure. And the observation of 1761 Venus transit from India, it resulted in inaccurate and varying values of the solar parallax. However, a reanalysis of all the observational data led to a mean value of 8.56 seconds of arc. So, the distance which I showed you, it is not, it was about 5, five and a half seconds of arc. So, this was one of the primary motivation to bring telescope in India observing the Venus transit and both groups of scientists they did it. And another important motivation was the survey of India as I was mentioning. Now, till the 18th century the maps of the subcontinent were based upon the information contained. You know Ptolemy gives a detailed description of course inaccurate about the Indian Peninsula, you know. That is something very surprising. So, old text by Ptolemy, Uluk Beg and Aini Akbari. These were the source from which the maps of India used to be drawn. And obviously, they are very inaccurate. And East India Company, after gaining political control over a large part of the subcontinent, started mapping to gain knowledge of the interiors and coastal areas for their further plans to expand their kingdom. So, the noted astronomer Ruben Barrow was the first to suggest the use of astronomy for surveying and mapping India. And he also conducted extensive astronomical observations for accurate determination of latitudes and longitudes. These are the two primary requirements. And thus, the detailed surveying of the subcontinent led to the development of telescopic astronomy in the year 1786, some reorganizations and etc. the setup was ready and 1792 considered to be the official year and this was done in Madras. In India, the first observatory, it was a very ramshackle affair of course, a small building, the photograph, the pictures of those I have given in the book, you know. So, it was a small building with some small outfit, that was the first observatory. Uh, 1786. Initially, it was semi-government, some private uh, uh, enterprise, enterprise kind of thing, but a formally accepted uh, government observatory it became 1792. 
and this is also considered to be the official year of the establishment and Goldingham was the first in charge astronomer of that first observatory in India in 1790. Now, subsequently observatories, both private and government owned, were set up at Lucknow, Tribandra, Pune, Dehradun, Calcutta, Kodaikanal, Hyderabad and Vaisal. The universities also established observational facilities at Calcutta, Allahabad University and BHU. Work on physical astronomy also started, that was of course a bit later. And in solar astronomy, India made an impressive contribution because Everset was the astronomer in charge of our Kodaikanal uh, Observatory for a long time. And he is considered to be one of the most noted uh, astronomer in, for solar astronomy and his data are still used and kept in Kodaikana. Now, some important uh, things uh, should be known to you uh, at this time. So, I told about Madras Observatory. This Madras Observatory from the beginning of 19th century, its major usage was related to Great Trigonometric Survey of India. And Madras became the Greenwich of India. The, till 1830, this observatory was engaged in surveying organized astronomical finding oriented astronomy because of the ongoing survey of India and subsequently this observatory made many important contributions including the publication of the famous Madras catalogue of 11,000 stars in the southern sky in the year 1843. From this observatory, Captain Jacob showed that the recently discovered ring of Saturn was not solid and after 1864, this observatory did not receive any new instrument and the most productive period for this observatory was 1830 to 1864. The first Indian astronomer who was associated with Madras <coughs> Observatory in the 19th century was Chintamani Raghunathachar. He was the head assistant and a skilled observer. His first paper was submitted to the Royal Astronomical Society in 1859 and he was the first Indian to have discovered two new variable stars. In 1872, he was elected as a fellow of the Royal Astronomical Society, the first one in India. Now the government of India decided to set up an observatory at Kodai Canal, which is still one of the major observatory of India, and which had the objective of making solar observations, as I mentioned, as solar activities, why they were interested in solar observatory, because India being a tropical country, it was expected that solar activity will be controlling our monsoon, which is so important for the agriculture in India. That's why they decided to uh, establish Kodai Canal Observatory primarily for solar observation. Also, something like that was done in Dehradun. And Lucknow and Tribandam Observatories, there is two funny, funny story. The progress of Madras Observatory and Great Trigonometric Survey prompted two native kings, one in the north and the other in the south, to promote astronomical observations. Now, truly speaking, they did so to assist the British because in those days, many things they used to do to assist and help them to get all kinds of other things like kitab, like Rai Bahadur, this. So somebody will make a uh, race course, somebody will make a uh, Hall, hall for uh, ball dance, all kinds of things. So they did this to primarily assess British. The Nawab of Oath declared independence from the ailing Mughal Empire in 1819 and his successor Nasibuddin Haider founded an observatory at Lucknow in the year 1831. It is interesting if somebody does research to trace where it was and what kind of uh, remnants are still available. Nobody has done it so far. However, he requested the British to appoint a director for the observatory and the major James Dowling Herbert was appointed as the incumbent. Receiving mm -hmm. generous funding from the king, Herbert ordered for the best possible instruments. Unfortunately, he died in 1833, just after two years. And the next astronomer in charge was Lieutenant Colonel Richard Wilcox who was also an astronomical assistant at the Great Trigonometric Survey. He built the observatory and the instruments were put up and he planned the observational activity quite meticulously. 
Finally, the observatory was ready for regular observation in 1841. Since it contained the best possible instruments, including a mural quadrant, this mural quadrant you will find if you see Tycho Bahe's pictures, etc. You find this quadrant uh, was a very uh, favorite uh, instrument for angular measurement. Bigger the quadrant, more accurate the marking, and bigger, better with the result. A, a mural quadrant, a transit telescope, as I mentioned, transit telescopes could rotate only like that. And their objective was primarily to see when a particular star just crosses this zenith, you know, that time, you know. Since it contained a, and a, an equatorial telescope and clocks, because clock was very important, so you will find that every old astronomical observatory, so clock will be mentioned because that is so important. And also there was hope for producing excellent results. But unfortunately the results from the observations were never published and after Wilcox died in 1848, the king closed down the observatory on the ground of its not being useful to the people of out. The British wanted to rebuild it after the mutiny of 1857, but it was found to have been destroyed by the rebel soldiers and the records containing all the results were also eaten by insects and thus one of the best equipped astronomical observatories in India was closed down without producing any result. The initiative for setting up the Trivandam Observatory was taken up by the British scientist and King Raja Varma approved the request and John Caldecott was the main person when the observatory was established in 1837. They were more or less same time, the out and this one. The observatory was also furnished with transit telescope, mural circle, equatorial telescope and clocks. Unfortunately, this observatory also met with the same fate as that of the counterpart in Lucknow. By 1852, the instruments were so dilapidated that the astronomical observation came to an end and luckily Trivandrum being located near the magnetic equator, the observatory sustained some scientific work on magnetism and meteorology. More or less during the same period, then I think uh, I, it went on, a Pune there was an observatory and some observatories were uh, erected on private enterprise in those days. So Pune observatory, there is an interesting story, Dehradun observatory, then observatories in Calcutta, then this is a private observatory very well known, Takta Singhji observatory, Pune. So after this solar observatory at Dehradun, Another solar observatory came up in Pune in 1888. The single person behind the setting up of this first modern astrophysical observatory was Kawasji Dadabhai Nagambala. He was born in the year 1857 and was a brilliant student of physics at Elphinstone's College, Bombay. He received the Chancellor's gold medal in his MA examination in 1878. Subsequently, he joined the college as a lecturer in physics 1882. In the same year when Maharaja Takta Singhji of Bhavanagar visited the college, he appealed to the Maharaja for a donation to start a spectroscopic laboratory. You can see now spectroscopic activities started. The grant of rupees 5000 was matched by a similar amount and after the discovery of solar spectral lines by Farnopar around 1812 and subsequent work by Karshap and Bunsen in 1859, this spectroscopy started being used to the celestial bodies. In India, Father Lafont, I think many, uh, Amitabha, you may have heard about Father Lafont. He was a professor at St. Xavier's College. And at the same time, Swami Vivekananda, Lafont, they are very close collaborators. And Lafont was one of the major persons uh, to promote science education in India. And Mahindralal Sarkar Lafont, they used to organize uh, scientific lectures as IIT Kanpur does, evening like this. The ticket used to be rupees two in the beginning of the 10th, 20th century. And you know, most often the hall used to be full without any seat remaining vacant. Now if you organize a lecture in Calcutta, mm -hmm. if you give people 200 rupees, you <laughs> may get a few, but you see the, how the society deteriorates. 
Anyhow, so the St. Xavier's College also uh, had an observatory in uh, Calcutta. When we were students, it was there. So Father Gore used to be the primary person. Now, uh, the uh, St. Xavier's College Observatory, Nagamala visited and he was so uh, uh, impressed and gained exp uh, the experience in spectroscopy. And at Lafon's recommendation, Nagamala proceeded to Europe in 1884 to finalize the equipment he wanted to have. Then, of course, he changed his area, he became an astronomer and he came back and started the astronomical observatory in Pune. Of course, later it had to be because all such single person uh, endeavors, they met with uh, unfortunate situation that after their death, nobody was there to take up. So what happened? All the equipment of this were transferred to Kodai Canal. Kodai Canal Observatory is still one of our primary observatories. And I think it is under the control of Indian Institute of Astrophysics at Koramangala, Bangalore. They are operated, they control it. Then there was another private entrepreneurship in Hyderabad, Nizamiya Observatory. It didn't produce much good result, but it made some very good star catalogs. It was the special effort they had. And uh, this work which they started, and I think 7,63,542 stars observed and located. And laser result was published in 12 volumes. Then there was another very private observatory in Vizag, Jaggarao and Nursing Row, the father-in-law and son-in-law. They set up something which, of course, vanished after some time. And uh, in West Bengal, or not West Bengal, Bengal, this Kalinath Mukherjee and Radha Govinda Chandra were some early astronomers. And what happened? Kalinath Mukherjee was born at Jaidia in Jesore district, which is now in Bangladesh, and received his college education at Krishnanagar and graduated with honors in mathematics, philosophy, and Sanskrit. After graduating in 1872, he studied law. And 1873, he started practicing law at his native district. During his college education at Krishnagar, he came in contact with Sir M. J. Herschel, the grandson of the great astronomer Sir William Herschel. You know, Herschel, he discovered which one, Uranus or Planet? I think Uranus or Neptune, which one, I, I forget. Which is called Herschel's planet. Maybe Neptune, yeah. So I think he also made a lot of observations and he wrote a Sanskrit text also. Bhagola Chitram, Radha Govinda Chandra was also a private astronomer in Bengal. And ultimately, the main impetus to astronomy in India came from Professor Vainu Bapu. You must have heard his name. He is the primary person in promoting astronomy. He first came to Allahabad Observatory, which was shifted to Nainita, which is still there. Uh, now they have changed the name to Aryabhatta Research Institute for Observational Science at Manora Peak. But later he shifted to Kodai Canal and spent his life. And the main big telescope was his design, the largest telescope we had till recently. Now of course we have bigger one. But he unfortunately died at a young age. But his, that telescope and that observatory has been named after him as Venu Bapu Observatory. Then of course, any of these people like Ravanath Acharya or Kalinath they also did astrology because a lot of astronomers no, did astrology. No, I think uh, they, it doesn't show. They did astronomy only. Primarily star catalogs, observation, finding out double stars or variable stars, these are the kind of things. They were not astrologers. Tycho Bahar was a big astrologer. Yeah, they too, even Kepler was an astronomer. Uh, Kepler. Kepler earned his livelihood just because he was the king's astronomer. They told the king that you should do this, then you know, win the war and that kind of thing. Most of the people there, nobody was interested in what is happening, whether earth is going down the sun or sun going down the earth, it hardly matters to me. Even today also I believe you don't really bother. <laughs> but I think uh, their main thing was astrology. But the only good thing is that it provided the motivation to do astronomy and the science progressed.
Now I think uh, I'll take up the last two topics I wanted to <coughs> take. The two of will be, one will be antiquity of Indian astronomy and the other will be originality of the Indian astronomy. Both are actually a little bit controversial issues because there are two camps. And one camp will say they are all, the, it is Indian astronomy is very recent, they are all copied from the Hellenistic astronomy in Greek and the 11th century AD, etc. Another group will say, no, no, they are very original and long back, you know, they have the originality and they are very old. So I think it is better to have some discussion and primarily keeping the scientific aspect of the whole thing rather than depending, being emotional that our everything you push back to very antiquity and uh, millions of years ago, I think that's not a good thing. And that's why we have always lost credibility in the Western science. <laughs> because there will be always a group of people who will say, oh, these are all tens of thousands of years, lakhs of years. <coughs> but as I mentioned, personally I think, though it, I have not found it anywhere, <coughs> that this kind of idea came mainly because of that calculation procedure. Mahajuga, these people really started thinking they are real physical things like Mahajuga Kali. Now I think uh, archaeo astronomy is a very interesting uh, topic. Nowadays uh, planetarium software that they have and as, as you have done, anybody can download and can do little bit of study. Though you cannot do research with the simple softwares, for that you need some more elaborate softwares. But I think many things you can study. So this archaeoastronomy is a new kind of subject. Now it has two branches. In one branch of astron archaeoastronomy, uh, you look into the orientation of very ancient structures, say like say pyramid or Harappa Manjida or settlements, because it has been found even in ancient times, the major structures, the people used to orient with some uh, important <coughs> principal directions like north, south, east, west, like that. They will not put it at random. So like pyramids, etc., they are very accurately oriented towards north, east of that time. So then, seeing the present day orientation, the deviation from the two directions, you can find out approximately how many years or thousand years back uh, the directions which was used uh, could be the true directions of north or east. So that is one. For that you need a big structure. Another branch of archaeoastronomy, there you don't need any structure or anything. You only need a description. And by now I am quite sure you have an idea what that description is. It is the precision of the equinox. Uh, but there are two, th quite a few things which can be done. One is the precision of the equinox and another is the advance of the perihelion. Both are uh, useful in archaeoastronomy. So in the precision of the equinox where our axis precises with a period of 25,800 years, long enough period uh, to span the whole human history, civilization history. And uh, what are actually seen, the, the constellations in different seasons. So like as I mentioned that now in winter, if you stand in the evening, you will find Orion is rising in the eastern sky. But if you find a description that Orion is rising uh, in the springtime, then obviously it was much, much earlier sometime. Another is the asterisms, that is nakshatras and stars at solstitial and equinoctial positions. That means which nakshatra was in the equinox. This was very important as you will see later when I come to the application of that. And that was that mentions are there. And that changes because of the precision of the equinox. What is on vernal equinox today? after a few thousand years will not be there because the vernal equinoctical point will shift along the uh, ecliptic to a different position. So a different nakshatra will be the equinox. Third is description of heliacal risings. Heliacal rising I have explained that uh, what stars you find last to rise before the sunlight appears. And that was very common in India because uh, the, uh, our Munis, Rishis, they used to get up very early, not like our students and our children. 
at 10 o'clock you have to push them up. So they used to go take bath and they used to do pray all those things facing east always. Of course in India, early morning it is always you pray facing the east and obviously you will observe things, you know. If you do it again and again, day after day, year after year, you will observe if you are observant. And also analysis of the pole star, as I mentioned. The pole star changes with time. Today we have a pole star which is called Polaris and uh, 15 uh, or 2000 years back there was no pole star and maybe again 3500 years back there was another pole star. So that also gives some idea of giving approximate, it cannot make any accurate calculation but can give you some idea about the antiquity of things. And another one which one tries is the analysis of the ancient eclipses. There will be always some description, particularly total solar eclipse is a very, very, what I say, very noticeable event and in all text you will find that suddenly in the daylight it becomes dark. There always there will be impetus for describing it, you know. And now you know that if you analyze those eclipses, you can try to find out when it happened, because the location when it happened, which particular season, the date it happened, which particular time of the day. As I think who was telling it, many people uh, tries to uh, interpret Jayadrat Bad, where the sun disappeared then came out again, as a total or near total solar eclipse before sunset, you know. So people have used that and tried to uh, use software and find out that whether or when such a solar eclipse took place. But difficulty as I was mentioning that eclipse, particularly total eclipse is only visible from a small area on the surface of the earth. And the, so location of the earth's surface in a particular, particular orientation is very important. When you go back thousands of years back, it is very difficult because rotational history of the earth, it is slowing down, you know, it is approximately I think 6 into 10 days to minus 22 radian per second square is our retardation. But that is an average value. There are fluctuations. So, uh, so this, this secular mean value may not give you correct location of the earth's surface. So sometimes it does not match. So therefore different softwares give different results about this uh, eclipse. Another thing which is used, rarity of event, the two consecutive eclipses. So in Mahabharata you will find that there were two eclipses within a fortnight, a 13 days gap. That was considered to be very bad omen. <coughs> it is very clearly mentioned in the Uddog Parva, I believe. So that also people have used software and they try to see that uh, when uh, two consecutive uh, eclipses took place within 13 days, which is very rare event. They have found something, but it is not very easy. Particularly this uh, eclipse during Mahabharata war, results don't match, different uh, software give different results. So therefore this can give sometimes some idea, but not very dependable in my opinion. My opinion is that Precision of the equinox is the best and most stable and dependable way. Now advance of perihelion, advance of perihelion is used in two ways. One is important, exaltation of Mars. This is a purely astrological terminology, but the phenomena is not astrological. What happens that uh, Mars's orbit is elliptic, Earth's orbit is also elliptic, but ellipticity or eccentricity is very small. So when Mars is in opposition, opposition means what? That Sun, Earth, Mars, they are in one line. So Mars will be nearest to Earth. Now that becomes still uh, more pronounced when Mars is at the perihelion position, nearest to Sun. So therefore, there are rare occasions when the Mars is at perihelion and also in also in opposition. That means, so that is the time when Mars is the nearest to Earth. And at that time, the brightness of Mars is three times that of star Sirius, which is the brightest star. 
and that is very visible in red star, so bright, that's what they call as exaltation of Mars. And there are reference to such exaltation of Mars in the past. And that also gives you, because I'll show you the calculation, because the Earth's rotation of the, or advance of perihelion is 0 0.332856 degrees per century. And for Mars, the advance of perihelion is 0 0.43355 degree per century. Now you see, uh, first let us see that Mahabharata war, if you try to apply Archaeo astronomy, what results you get. Now, I will not go into all kinds of that, that but the two uh, eclipses within a period of 13, I will not go into that. There was another uh, total solar eclipse at the time of death of Krishna, which was 28 years of after Krishna, Mahabharata war. That also sometimes people see and it was visible in Dwarka. You see that uh, one which is most, uh, uh, I will say, uh, ambi uh, non-ambiguous was the death of Vishya. It is very clearly mentioned that he died on the winter solstice day when the uh, whole thing changed from Dakshinayan to Uttarayan. He wanted to die on Uttarayan. So he died on the uh, winter solstice day. And it was also mentioned that it was the eighth day on the brighter half of the month of Magha. So, Shuklashtami in month of Magha. Now, you see, in, if you use this terminology, month of Magha means the full moon should be on Magha Natsatra. So, the configuration of the situation will be Earth here, Magha Natsatra, this is the moon and Magha Natsatra in this direction and this is sun. So, therefore, in this situation, you will see the full moon in Magha Natsatra. And it happened not on the full moon day, winter solstice was seven days before. So, earth was somewhere here actually, not here. So, this gap is seven days. By calculation, you can see that on 2400 BC, full moon took place at Baha Nakshatra also on the winter solstice day. Just I think I will try to show you using that same, actually you can do all these things, study yourself. Now let us see 2400 BC, how was the situation? And now you are familiar how to get it. <laughs> so 2400 BC will be, no, 2400. And winter solstice day, let us see, it will be? Zero to, zero to, two four zero two or? Oh, same thing, it will not matter much. Month of, I think I will put it, January or February, let us see with March. So we apply. So I think let us uh, mm, see. Winter solstice day will be when sun is at the extreme end of the ecliptic, isn't it? So it is the ecliptic, this is the ecliptic and extreme, um, I think, uh, this is sun, you can see now you have got this sun and this is the moon. Now it is not the full moon because on full moon sun and moon will be 180 degree apart, isn't it? And now it is not the full moon day. So you have to fix the date and date if you change to January 18th to say, let us see if, if we let it go to February 18th, where we are. You can do little bit trial and error, you can find out. So you can see now sun is here, but it is not winter solstice day. So, it, but I think now it is actually a uh, new moon time. Mm -hmm. So, I think with this I did it somewhere, but I think uh, I don't remember the dates exactly. You can bring sun and the winter solstice, uh, winter solstice that means extreme end of this, it will be somewhere here. 
somewhere here and moon's longitude will be or right ascension will be 12 hours different and also you will find that that full moon the moon will be against the nakshatra mokha so that has been done and it is regular cycle so this is easy to find out by using little bit of trial error that 2400 BC on such and such date uh, uh, full moon took place in Magha, it was the winter solstice day. But Mahabharata war uh, took place or the, when Vishya died, it was not the full moon day. It was winter solstice but seven days before the full moon. So what happens? The so now, what will be this day therefore? Now, two, this whole thing represents 365 days, but it takes how much time for it to come? 25,800 25, years. So seven days will mean how many years? Seven into, seven by 365 into 26,000. So this will be about few, two, uh, three, four hundred years. So, 24 BC and you reduce 5 or 600 years, whatever comes, you can calculate. So, that is the approximate time when this could have happened that uh, on the Shuklashtami of the month when the full moon took place on the Mahanakshatra and it was the winter solstice day. So, there are all these conditions you have to meet. Of course, it is very clear with this, it is difficult to do because Moha Nakshatra is not uh, one point. You know, each Nakshatra spans how much? 13 degrees. So, therefore, there will be always a chance, plus minus, this way, that way. I personally believe so. Many people try to show that such and such date, such and such time. That needs far more analysis. But one thing is true, you can say that Mahabharata work was approximately 15 to, I think, uh, around 18, 19 or 1500 kind of BC kind of things. I think it will be around 1900 BC. The reason is another, because everything must match. You know, I think Balaram is described to have taken a path along the bank of Saraswati and went up to the place where it vanished in the desert, Vinashana. So there, and in the geological research shows that Saraswati completely dried around 1900 BC. So after a few hundred years of that, perhaps uh, it will not be there. Most probably therefore around that time it happened. But there is another clue. That clue is, as I mentioned, that there is only one character who is found both in Puran and also in history. That is Mahapaddhananda. So Vishnu Puran says that after Parikshit, there are thousand, fifty or thousand five hundred years when Nanda became the king. <coughs> Jagat Parikshita Ujanma, Jagat Nanda Vishechanam, Itad Varsha Sahasrantu, Pancha Dasuttaram Gyam. Somebody says it is Pancha Satuttaram, somebody says Pancha Dasuttaram. So whatever it is, you will find you can easily calculate 1500 years was the time from Parikshit to Mahapaddhananda. Mahapaddhananda 10 generations from Chandragupta's time. So if you take 20 years or 25 years per generation, so another 200 years. So 1500 to 200 years or 1050 to 200 years, so 1250 years. And Chandragupta was about 258 BC or three? So you get about 16, 1700 BC on the other calculation, which has nothing to do with astronomy. So therefore, it is uh, opined by the experts like Bankimitan Chattopadhyay, who did a lot of research in 19th century on this, that Mahabharata war took place around 16, 17, 18, 1900 <coughs> around that time. You can tell approximately, but not 3000 BC, definitely. What many people say that because Kali Yuga is described as 3102 uh, and that was considered to be the end of 
Mahabharata when the Kali started. So many people do it that way and I think that is the source of mistake. Because Kali era was taken that day, who told you did? And we found that yes, approximately the planets were more or less the same meridian. And uh, people describe this as Kali era. And Kali is the beginning of uh, after Mahabharata war. So people associate Mahabharata war with 3100 BC. But calculations show other. Now, again, another thing you see Puranic text, Satapata Brahmana says very clearly a very interesting thing the rising of Kritika. Now, Kritika was a very important nakshatra, it was, it was the deity of, I think, fire, as I mentioned. And it is mentioned that Kritika always rises in the east. What does it mean? Something can rise in the east, means it must be on the celestial equator. But the nakshatras are not on the celestial equator, they are on the ecliptic. So only way it can be also in celestial equator, that when it is in one of the equinoctial points, either vernal equinoctial point or the autumn. Now if you assume that it was at autumn equinoctial point, uh, you will find that uh, it is very difficult, it will be some few tens of thousands of years back, which is not acceptable. If it is on vernal equinoctial point, you can easily see just now that Kritika is at the vernal equinoctial point around 2900 BC. And I can, you can see uh, when it rises now and when it used to rise then. Say, if I give the date as 2400 most probably I gave, I think I change it to 2900, let us see. Okay. Now let us see whether it rises Kritika in the east. Vernal equinox means? Vernal equinox means that when the ecliptic is coming from the south and intersects the... Yeah, you can see this is Kritika. This is Kritika. It is very much near the intersection of... This is the vernal equinoctical point. But now if you say, if you want to do, where it will be now you see it is rising far north it is here it is rising here so again and again it is described that Kritika is rising exactly in the east. It means it will be a description at least 2700-2800 years BC. That is another reference we get. Another thing we will get, so all the Puranic texts, this is the way the chronology has been derived by the Pandits or uh, scholars. Say Atharva Veda says, that Varnal equinox at Rohini, nakshatra. So again, the same way you will find that when Rohini nakshatra is near the Varnal equinox, when it could be there. This is more or less reasonable, it is easy to identify the Varnal equinoctical point and which nakshatra is there. So they find it is 3000 to 3500 BC, it was in the Varnal equinoctial point. And Rigvedic reference, it gives quite a few references. One is very interesting, which is called Madhuvidya. Now, Madhu was the name of uh, season Basanta. Basanta is comparatively more recent term. And the, the, the sages used to tell that when people should be prepared for harvesting in this northern Punjab region, West Punjab region. And that's why it was called Madhu Vita. And normally, the harvesting, etc., all those things are the uh, uh, season Basanta starts after two months of winter solstice. So very commonly now, everybody cannot say, find out when is the winter solstice, etc. So the easy way to was to see that uh, heliacal rising of some constellations. So triangulum, which is the, uh, they call Ashini, and uh, 
the heliacal rising of Ashini was found to be happening after two months of winter solstice. That means on the onset of. Now you see here it says many slokas are there in Rig Veda where it says that may the three wheel car of the Ashins, which is the harbinger of spring, drawn by swift horses, three canopies filled with treasure and every way auspicious, come to our presence and bring prosperity to our people and all these things. Another, the many slokas are there. In most cases now people have. Uh, they have found that it is the rise, heliacal rising of triangulum. So, and you find that you find <coughs> triangulum to rise heliacally around 4000 BC after two months of winter solstice. Another reference which I uh, showed you before that finding the true south direction by joining Alpha Canis minoris with Alpha Canis majoris, that also previous day I showed. The, I think first lecture was to have that it is 4000 BC approximately or 4100 BC if you, these two were in the same meridian that means if you join them it will point towards south pole. So all these things uh, another thing which in, in say that means the Orion's head was near the vernal equinoctical point now it is quite far off but uh, if you see at 4000 BC so date and time, let me give 4000 BC. So I think uh, uh, you will find vernal equinox is somewhere here. So we have to go back computer will help us to rotate, change the rotation of earth. So you see, this is the east, that means this is the east and this is the vernal equinox, it should stop. This is the vernal equinox, this is the celestial equator and so this is vernal equinoctical point and this is the Orion and head of Orion is here. Okay. And it cannot be on vernal equinox obviously because it is not on the ecliptic nor on celestial equator so it will never be on vernal but its head will be nearest to vernal equinoctical point. And that is what you find that the head of the Orion is near the vernal, nearest to vernal equinoctical. The vernal equinox is here and this is the head of the Orion. So you see currently if you see that and the, at present vernal equinox is where this is the vernal equinox point. This is the vernal, this is the east and this is the vernal equinox point and Orion is here, as you can see. Yeah. So it is far away. This is the Orion. This is Orion, this is Orion's head and Varnal equinox is somewhere. So many indications you have to match, just one description you cannot take and uh, predict or uh, take a decision. There are many ways you have to do and you will find most of the things that way will ultimately lead to this kind of things I have already given to you. That Varnal equinox was at Orion's head or Mrigashira, summer solstice, what? Uh, Rigvedic text gave rise to was in Uttar Falguni, Beta Leonis. Autumn equinox was in Mula, that is Lambda Scorpionics, and winter solstice location in Purva Bhadrapada. And all these descriptions match 4000 BC. Then Atri's description of that uh, annular eclipse on the summer solstice day 
what has been analyzed by Professor P. C. Sengupta was 4100 or some BC. But and that, that depended on the calculation of a partial ellipse, of annular ellipse. Annular ellipse. And as you were saying, these calculations may not be very reliable. May not be very reliable. And especially he did it a long time ago. Now you have computers. Yeah. So, but I think, you know, uh, uh, you may not, what, why I am saying this, in that region it could have happened, the exact spot you may not be able to see. That is the point. For uh, Panipuri or Kurukshetra is a very spot. But uh, if you increase your size of the region, then of course you can vary because it, you will find it there. That's how people think that you could do it. That such a thing happened exactly where you saw that, that you will not be able to see. But an annular eclipse happened, that you can always vary. Then uh, uh, the time period, etc., I have given my first slide already, so I need not go into that. And also, there is no need for to show the helical rising because we are short of time. And uh, so, this way, uh, Veda also refers to the fact that joining the stars Alpha Canis Minoris, Alpha Canis Majoris, I told you, that is 4350 BC. Now, another very interesting uh, astrology can be of our head exaltation of Mars. Now, due to the ellipticity of the Earth's and Mars's orbit, the minimum distance from the Earth is 55.35 into 10 days to 6 kilometer between Mars and Earth, and the maximum distance is 100.23, 10 days to 6. At the nearest position, Mars is three times brighter than the Sirius, compared to the situation when it is at the faintest with only 60 percent of the brightness of the Sirius. So, it is six times the brightness value of Mars. And this is called exaltation of Mars in astrology. In the post Vedanga Jyotish, the exaltation of Mars is said to have occurred at a position which is now away from the, that, uh, the current location by 13.7 degrees. Now where the exaltation takes place nowadays and that time when, where it took place the difference is 13.7 degrees. Now since this shift is at the rate of now every century the location of the exaltation point of Mars shifts by 0.43355 degree. And the period, because that is the rate of advance of perihelion of Mars, that's now I told. The Mars orbits perihelion shifts and exaltation will be always at the perihelion position. So the rate at which perihelion position shifts, that is the way the location of the uh, exaltation position of Mars in the ecliptic will also shift the same way. So, per every century, this position of exaltation shifts by 0.43355 degrees. So, when it occurred at a location which is now at a distance of 13.7 degrees, and that must have taken place almost 1160 BC. So, that is a post Vedanga period, you know. So, an exaltation of mass. Takes, uh, Mars uh, repeats at intervals of 15 and 17 years alternatively, but the perihelion position shifts, that's what I mentioned. So, this is the picture that this is the star against which the perihelion of the Mars is there and there is an exaltation. So, what happened? This slowly shifts, you know. So, exaltation position also will shift continuously, maybe after some time you will find that exaltation of Mars against star B when the line of apsides rotates to this position. And you can easily find out the duration, this angle divided by 0.4355. So that will give you so many centuries and obviously you can easily calculate. So this calculation was again done very meticulously by Professor Rana of Ayuka, because he is not alive, I think he is dead. He was a very outstanding astronomer. In one, 225 years, it moves to one degree, or it is the same thing, 0.4 something. You know. Now, another last topic I will talk about, originality of ancient Indian astronomy. Now, this was a matter of bitter controversy, you know, and they used to fight. It is far worse than the emails our faculty members in IIT Kanpur exchanges, you know. <coughs> so, I think uh, European scholars, they came in contact with the ancient Indian texts 
they never knew about a language like Sanskrit and they are so amazed to see its richness. That's why they are very jealous to say that they are, those things were done by them. Now, as the level of excellence of the ancient Indian literature, philosophy and science became gradually known, it gave rise to severe controversies and I mentioned that they thought that these people could not have done that, they are all bogus third-rate niggers and really society was extremely degenerate in 18th, 17th century. And some of course were somewhat more scholarly, they didn't have this kind of bias, they said no, 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 antiquity, etc., everything is there. So two things, are the one most important thing is the originality of the nakshatra system. That was one of the major debating point. Because in Chinese, uh, they Xiu with 24 stars, there is a system, uh, they thought that that is the first nakshatra system. In Arabic, there is something like manazil, that also used to describe the locations of the moon and gave rise to the suspicion that the origin was in China or West Asia or Babylon. Because the, any source of uh, wisdom, they generally has the tendency to take it to Babylon. And that was the usual habit. Even many of their scholars said that what is this? Anything good you find in either? They said it must have happened in Babylon and it has come here. Now Bio, for example, his opinion was that the China was the origin based upon his personal impression and feelings. The China, the these, that, and not based on any scientific reading. Rather, in the book you will find I have given the detailed analysis from various sources. Now Sanskrit, ultimately I will not go into those details, but Max Muller did some linguistic analysis and he proved that nakshatras find mention in Indian texts dating back to 3rd millennium BC. Of course, this date was not by him, this date was by the text he refers, now the dating of those texts are that is 3rd millennium BC. He also showed that the names of the three winter months in Chinese literature, Pehua, Mokua and Folkuna, are derived from the Sanskrit name Push, Pusha, Magha and Falguna. And these names are linked with the typical Indian system of naming months, <coughs> where full moon takes place against a nakshatra. This system is not there in any other literature or any other astronomy. So he said that since in China the names of the three winter months are according to the names of the Indian nakshatras, which is followed there, he said that it must have originated in India first and then going to China. It could not have happened the other way. And there are some other reasons, of course, there. I don't have time to discuss everything. Another thing, of course, is very surprising that India was unknown to Chinese till 126 BC. The name of river Sindhu first appeared in Chinese literature in 65 BC. <coughs> and later scholars like Thaibao proved that the nakshatra system could not have a Semitic origin either, that means not in West Asia. He showed from a study of the clay tablets found in Babylon that Babylonians were using the, to indicate the positions of the planets and moon with respect to the 12 divisions of the ecliptic, which he called signs. Though they don't, didn't have the names, but that was their system. They never had 27, so they did not use the 27 nakshatras for that. Some scholars feel that since moon's 27 positions is not very difficult to observe, many civilizations could have had perhaps uh, arrived at the same conclusion. So there is nothing strange about it. It was a very obvious thing to do. So there is no need to fight like that. Another important point is the similarity with Siddhantic astronomy and Greek astronomy. The old, it has been found, I am not going to the detailed description that is in the book, you will find. But the older version of Surya Siddhanta, which was later changed by Baraha Mira, it describes two distinct planetary theories. In the older theory, the planets are considered to be attached to invisible cords of air which drove the planets. The cords of air through which the gods stationed at the apogee produced the motions were called Prabhaha. It is a very unique thing in Indian astronomy, it is not there in Greek astronomy. And this ancient system was also devised to explain the uneven motions of the planets, why it is sometimes fast, sometimes it is slow. 
and the motions of the planets were classified into eight classes far more sophisticated than Greek astronomy and it was before the Greeks came, it was in the older version of Surya Siddhanta. And the eight classes of motions of the planets were Vakra, Onuvakra, Kutila, Manda, Mandalara, Sama, Otisigra and Sikra. So qualitatively since they didn't have numbers to measure, so what they did, they described it qualitatively with eight different classes of motion which is obviously quite sophisticated considering the period. And this classification is considered to be the relic of some still forgotten parts of ancient Indian astronomy. Twelve signs were also recognized as I mentioned <coughs> even during the Mahabharata period, but the names were not given. Now extensive analysis of the Indian and Greek system of European scholars reveal that the two systems are very different and the Siddhantic astronomers use oval shaped epicycles and not circles. <coughs> the reason you know in Ptolemic system you could not match it well with one epicycle with circular shape. Then they added another AP epicycle, then another AP AP epicycle. Whereas Indian system they didn't use a circle at all. They used an oval shaped body. And uh, uh, what Burgess stated in the middle of 19th century. Just, uh, so like if it is Tycho Brahe kind of system, then oval is elliptical orbit. Elliptic oval is like ellipse. Actually, they didn't know the ellipse. They called all such things as oval shaped. Mm -hmm. Even Kepler initially tried when that eight minutes of arc he was unable to match the masses mm -hmm. orbit. Mm -hmm. He first tried with oval. Much later he came to ellipse to see the perfect line. He did lot of experiment with oval shaped, like eggs, you know. The reason is this, that it is very psychological, you see. If sun is helping or influencing and sun is one side, then the body cannot be symmetric like this. Tendency will be to consider it sun centric or one focus. So it tends to become an over psychologically. So Burgess stated, and yet I must think the Hindus original in regard to most of the elementary facts and principles of astronomy and for the most part also in their cultivation of science and that the Greeks borrowed from them, rather their facts and principles. But this gave a detail in his arguments regarding the originality of the Indian astronomy in regard to the 27 asterisms and 12 signs also. He further mentions, as regards the resemblance between the Greek and Hindu methods of calculating the two places of planets, I think that only hints could have passed from one people to another. We find it difficult to see precisely what it was that the Hindus borrowed, since in no case do the numerical data and results in the two systems exactly correspond. Values are very different. So it was definitely not a kind of copy. Maybe some ideas were exchanged. And the Hindus are more nearly correct than the Greeks in their numerical values. And of course, there are many more points on this matter, but without going further, I will end this session by the following statement from Playfair, his paper in the Transactions of Royal Society of Edinburgh about two centuries ago. I quote, of such high antiquity, therefore, must we suppose the origin of this astronomy, unless we can believe that all the coincidences which have been enumerated are but the effects of chance or what indeed were still more wonderful that some ages ago there had arisen a Newton among the Brahmins to discover that universal principle which connects not only the most distant regions of space but the most remote periods of duration and a de la grange to trace through the immensity of both in most subtle and complicated operations. So I think, uh, friends, uh, I think I'll stop here. And I think that you will enjoy uh, going through uh, more uh, elaborate text. But the simpler version for a common man's language we have done at the request of Ramakrishna Mission Institute of Culture, which students can read. Of course, what I have given, far more details are there. More importantly, this gives all the necessary bibliography and references in detail. So if you want to read further, all the references you will find here. And that I have given this, uh, uh, the book here, 
as the primary reference, but you can see the bibliography. And of course, this is the end of the lecture series. And many thanks. I never expected that there will be so many till the last lecture, because normally I am told that it is the camera wala or cameraman or the the Dari school jana hai na. Somebody was telling that he was happy that lecturer that you are still here. No, sir, I cannot leave that. Uh, that Delhi, the carpet is mine, I have to take it. <laughs> so many interesting stories, you know, the one person came to give a lecture and uh, he is a very famous talk, talk and audience is there, and he was invited. Then uh, he was asking that, how long can I talk? Then the organizer, the person like Amit said, sir, I think you are such an outstanding speaker coming from a distant, we are so fortunate that you are here. So you can speak as long as you want, but we leave in 55 minutes. <laughs> <laughs> okay, thank you, friends. Thank you very much. You only told your power as a teacher that still attract people here after <laughs> five minutes. So I will request everyone to stay back for a couple of minutes. Before he takes the questions and answers, I will request, request Professor Mahindra Varma to give him a small, small memento on behalf of physics society. Mm -hmm. You are getting... Mm -hmm. So, photo lady. Okay. Okay. Photo session. Okay. <laughs> photo session. <laughs> Thank you very much. It was excellent. <laughs> Okay, now it's open for questions, if you have any question, and from Monday you can send request, PDF file, PPT files, I will send this PDF version, whoever wants, okay? So if you have any question. In uh, Somnath temple which I visited recently, yeah. there is supposed to be a pole, it's supposed to be? I think there is a pole. Uh -huh. And it's supposedly some temples are where if you see then the line will go to the south pole. Okay. That is now I'm not sure which which year does it correspond to, but I am I have never been there. Yeah. 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 There are no more questions. You have a question? Please. Huh. Yes. There are videos for Panji cars available. Videos? What Panji cars? Panji cars. Panji cars. And they often differ by your day. Huh? And they often differ by your day. Some of Panji cars are today in the full moon or some of the Panji cars are still in the full moon. So these kind of differences are there in Panji cars. No, no, Panjika in India, it is a total confusion. That's why Balgangasa, Tilak, they all tried to bring a reform and uniformity. There was a lot of work on that. And the reason you can see somebody is using this era, somebody is using this data, all kinds of variations were there. Okay. But I think government of India, later I think with Meghnath Saha, they I tried to say did something. We should take calendar committee. Yeah, calendar committee was there. Yes. 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 I have to give my uh, 15 minutes interview to Tusha, are you here? Yeah, yeah, yeah. He asked me everything, where I graduated from, whether my PhD in mechanical <coughs> engineering. And uh, he said that he wants to become a scientist. He said, that's very good, excellent. But only unfortunate thing that he wants to do MBA. <laughs> yeah. Yes. Yeah. 
nowadays. Actually, you know, about uh, 2000 years back, some of our rituals we started, and that time it was the 14th of January was the date of winter solstice. That's why you are still doing that Makar Sankranti kind of thing, but which it is, it has nothing to do with that now. Uh, it has shifted to 21st uh, December. But earlier, about 2000 years back, you can easily calculate, considering the precision of the equinox, how many thousand years back it was the winter solstice. And then we started our rituals and such things, you know. Michel pointed out that it was uh, the Vikram basically Vikramaditya time. Hmm. So, so that is 70 uh, years, it shifted by one day. Yeah. So sure. basically, it was not corrected. Precisely. So it That's remains as 14th of January, but it has come. I think it, it is the 15th because yeah. of the 76 years. Yeah. So it is very easy to calculate that. Yeah, the correction, I think in Punjab, after he says that they are not corrected after Vikramaditya. Vikramaditya, that day was 22nd December. But Ujjain, that's when it started. But the correction was not made, so it is shifting every 76 years. Actually, about uh, approximately Vikram Saka was around 2000 years old. So, you will find that it was started then, and so it has shifted, but that has not been taken note of. We are taking the same date as the winter subsidy. Otherwise, there is no significance of 14th of January. Okay. okay. So, no more, no more questions. We'll thank. Uh, Professor Ghosh again, and also the team of Physics Society for <coughs> the hard work, Dipanja and his team, uh, members from Lecture Hall, and uh, <coughs> here, all of you attended, so we hand for that.